Black Doctors Podcast. Hello, and welcome back to Black Doctors Podcast. I am Steven, your host. Thanks for joining us once again. We're going to jump back into an episode featuring Dr. David Miles. He is a pediatrician, and we focus the rest of this episode talking about his specialty that he's kind of taken on in the field of pediatric pain management, dealing with a lot of addiction issues, and so interesting to see that he's built this niche practice for himself. If you've been watching the news, you know there's a full-on assault on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts with the state of Alabama passing some legislation, making it kind of illegal to give funding to different organizations. And more recently, a bill was introduced that would nationwide make it illegal for funding to go towards DEI efforts and offices for institutions that receive federal funding. So definitely something to keep an eye on in the news. It seems like just yesterday that we were celebrating the victory that the dermatologists had in their national meeting against the efforts to sunset the DEI policies. And the opposition is just heating up. They're not slowing down to that end. I highly recommend going back and listening to episode nine. So season nine, episode nine of the podcast. It features Dr. Italo Brown. He reached out to me and was like, hey, we got to talk about what's going on. In, DE, in, the, in the realm of DEI. So we sat down and he really broke it down and fantastic, fantastic episode kind of paints a roadmap for how we should approach these issues in the future and what all is actually at stake and how do we navigate in this new construct. For other updates, I do want to highlight our website. So the blackdoctorspodcast.com this is all a labor of love, but I actually had some time to sit down and update the website. So if you have time, go check it out. You can see an archive of all the episodes that we've done and the show notes along with that. In the next week or so, I, I hope to be able to organize those based upon you know the specialty that's been featured or is it a male physician or a female physician, etc. So it's a work in progress, but let me know what you think so far the, of, the, of the progress we've made. On the website, you'll see some forms if you want to get featured on the show. If you are an entrepreneur, you have a side hustle you want to feature, starting your own practice, you're a residency program director, coordinator, you want to highlight your residency program, check out the website, check out that form, and send the information directly to myself and, and the team, and we can get that coordinated and set up. Last but not least, this is the week of the Student National Medical Association Medical Education Conference, which is going to be held in New Orleans, Louisiana. I will be there. I am doing uh, judging for a poster presentation, I think, on Friday, and then part of a panel on anesthesia on Saturday. If you see me walk around, definitely come up and say hello. Would love to hear from you. Put a face with the name. I always appreciate the support and seeing listeners in person. It's always uh, encouraging and helps me know that this is actually making a difference and that we should keep on uh, cranking out these episodes. Additionally, I will be uh, handing out some gifts, nothing big, just a couple small tokens of appreciation. If you find me at the conference while supplies last, I'll have a small token of my appreciation for you being a loyal listener and, and supporter. And if you are a fourth year medical student, especially matched, didn't match, whatever it is, if you're graduating, you're completing medical school, I will have something special for you as well while supplies last. So looking forward to an excellent conference and hope to see you there. Now we're going to jump into the rest of this episode featuring Dr. David Miles, pediatrician. It's fascinating that exposure helped launch that next phase in your career because you mentioned one of your passions is for this pediatric mental health and then more specifically opioid abuse. In the ivory tower of academic medicine, we have people that so specialize in pediatric pain and child and adolescent psychiatry. But as a general pediatrician, you, like, like you said, everybody can't see a specialist. And you are there, boots on the ground, with a passion for this mental health. Can you talk about how you built that into your practice as you left the Navy? Yeah, it, and I guess I didn't tell the, the full story. I became I worked on Capitol Hill for a minute with a congressperson who was really interested in the mental health of the military. 
I had a medical background, but I didn't know much about the military. I knew something about mental health. I was on the fence between pediatrics and child and adolescent psychiatry, but ultimately chose pediatrics. So I began to learn about it then, this notion that uh, among children of active duty service members, the incidence of mental health disorders is significantly increased. And it's not, not, there's nothing wrong with the kids. It's just that they deal with a lot of stresses that other kids don't. A family member that's gone for a deployment for months to years, a family member that might come back dealing with their own either physical, mental, or other health challenges, or a family member that might not come back at all because they were killed. In addition to the stressors of just regular military life, moving every three years or so, creating new friends, like these kids are just dealing with a lot. And so I think the statistics like one out of five children in the civilian population has some sort of or is dealing with some sort of mental health disorder among military kids is like one out of three. So a huge population of need, but certainly even the civilian population, we don't have enough providers. In D.C. Metro, we're having a relative abundance, but still there are long, months long waits to get kids in. So there's been a realization from the, the providers of psychiatric services, as well as uh, the generalists, that more needs to be done from a funding perspective. That's what's working in Congress on that. How can we recruit or entice more medical students to enter psychiatry via, is it loan payback sorts of things, among others, to help incentivize that? To On the other side, it's like, well, we just have to deal with the situation we have. As generalists, we need to be more comfortable with managing that anxiety, depression. We can't just refer everybody out because there's just not enough providers. And that's, it's been a, a slow process, but we're getting better. I spend half my time seeing patients and other half my time teaching pediatric mm. residents. And okay. they're much more savvy than I was 10 plus years ago when I was in training. I was following <laughs> that, man, I'm getting old. <laughs> but, and then the trick, the things that I'm less comfortable with that they're even more comfortable with is dealing with patients that, might carry multiple diagnoses. So it might be a child who's dealing with ADHD in addition to anxiety or ADHD and depression. My own rule of thumb is like, if you're on one medication that affects the brain, I'm cool with two. Like I might have to call out, but I'm I'm becoming increasingly comfortable. The main thing is learning how to recognize symptoms, treat them, and then follow up, which Mm -hmm. in the outpatient primary care setting, we we actually have a great ability to bring a person back in, in two to four weeks. And then with the the pandemic offered great opportunities in terms of changing how we practice medicine. So um, in years past, we'd have to bring patients in, take them out of school. But telehealth had really taken off during the pandemic. I think it's here to stay. And it's been a, a benefit. There are patients that I've diagnosed and treated with depression that I've never seen in person. <laughs> it's been all virtual, wow. particularly those transitioning, those in college and such. It, provi- it allows them to, to get care when they need, how they need it. And we're able to reach more people. And there are funding and other changes in the rules at the federal level that's been helping us to do that and to be able to practice in multiple areas as opposed to just being licensed in one state and seeing patients there. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that's fantastic. Again, you found this niche and this need and and are working to fill it. And I I would just say to the listeners, these ivory palaces of higher education where where we're like, you need to subspecialize and super niche markets realize when you get out into practice, if you have a passion for something that is, again, within your scope of practice and your licensure, you can then read journal articles, collaborate with other people to learn how to be proficient in those kind of more specific areas and provide care that would otherwise be lacking. So so kudos to to you for filling that need. I think it's, it's a, I think having a medical background gives you entry in a lot of areas and you've mastered the skill set of ingesting large amounts of information yeah. and being able to use it appropriately, but it lends itself to a variety of disciplines. You're, you have a podcasting thing that it's not an easy thing to do, but you do it well. And I, I imagine there's some crossover between some of the skills that you picked up along the way. So it's a great skill set to have being a physician. You can take it anywhere you want and then you can branch off and do different things off the goal of improving the health of everybody. Yeah. So you, we talked about some of the policy work you've done and are doing, the mental health work, but you mentioned, and I, I actually just interviewed an anesthesiologist, Pete's anesthesiologist, Alicia Peterson, who does Pete's pain. And I was like, I, I knew that you could put the two words together, Pete's and, and pain, but opioid 
addiction or abuse in kids is a thing. I'm learning. Very much so. And it's a it's something that physicians aren't responsible for. Not you. <laughs> yes, it's, it's well, well, but it's it's often, easy, well, they try to make those, right? Usually the perioperative, something can trigger. Sometimes there's a, it's, an event. True. So I'm, I mean, I'm not so, off the hook. You know, as, much as, I, as much as I want to be off the hook, I, I may be playing. Uh, so I, I is, think, so. But it's, it's often, it'd be the kid comes in with a broken bone. So I used to work for emergency rooms. And we do a close reduction there under, I wouldn't even call it anesthesia, we call it conscious sedation or what have you, little ketamine and such to the dads maybe. And it's a broken bone. And back in the day, it was like, oh, we have to give them opioids. Yeah. And that, that was the mantra up until like 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we were taught that pain is a vital sign. You have to, yeah. no different from temperature, blood pressure, respiratory rate. We have to figure out what their pain is. And that was intentional by the opioid producers to get in part their product out. But it certainly did affect kids. So it's kids coming with the broken bones, tooth extractions. I had my wisdom teeth taken out. I, don't, I think they may have given me some, but I just, I was really leery of, of medication more broadly at that time. But that's how it starts for, for some of us. And I wrote a piece on this I, as a pediatrician. I'm, I'm part of the problem because when I was coming out, we just poured opioids on kids. And we commonly see it in, in as I mentioned, the orthopedic emergencies about broken bones and teeth. But then on the other side, there's a significant population of kids dealing with pain who are undermanaged. So these are children, primarily African-American, who were dealing with sickle cell. Mm, and they were yeah. seen as drug treat, drug seeking, right? They're right. dealing with some serious pain, but were thought to be less worthy of, of receiving medication. So it's this kind of weird paradox within the treatment of pain. But suffice as it um, to say that Kids do develop addiction to opioids. And uh, even today, there's not a recognition that kids need to derive some of the benefits from the treatments of opioid use disorder. Many of the institutions for inpatient uh, substance use disorder are only open if for, for people 18 and above. But you have, you know, I had a patient who was 17 whose father was just waiting for him to turn 18. So who, wow. a 17-year-old dealing with uh, substance use disorder, opioids, that they couldn't get into treatment because he wasn't old enough. So when soon as he turned 18, we were able to at least apply for him to get him. He died for, from something separate, unfortunately. Hmm. But there's just not, even today, despite all the big money coming out of big pharma from these opioid settlements, not as much a recognition that we need, that one, kids are dealing with uh, substance use and uh, overuse um, disorders and certainly not enough put on treatment. Again, some other things that came out that were a benefit of the pandemic were uh, the licensing requirements to to do medicated assisted treatment like Suboxone, they used to be like you said they're eight hour class. It was super laborious. During pandemic, you can do training online, and I finally got certified to to be able to administer Suboxone for those who needed medication assisted treatment. Whether or not my institution will allow me to prescribe it for kids under eighteen is <laughs> remains to be determined. So yeah, there are yeah. a lot of procedural hoops that we still have to jump through. But yeah, kids are dealing with it, unfortunately. And the less we talk about, it, the more it's going to happen under the radar. And so now, we need to do more to, to it. When you say kids, how old are we talking? That's fair. So it's usually late okay. teens, mid to late teens, six, fifteen, you don't sixteen, see like year olds. Six-year-olds feeding for fentanyl. No, what we are seeing on the young ones is more with the legalization of marijuana. We're seeing a lot of cost of poison control, like kids ingesting parents' edibles. Probably okay. once a month, I would see that in the emergency room. And I think we really need to do something about that, too. Personally, I, I think, so Maryland, I'm, I'm in Maryland, they just voted to, to legalize. I'm on board with decriminalization, but I think we still need to learn more before we say it's okay. Because I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about from the perspective of children, we just don't know enough. And I'm just seeing way too many overdose, unintentional ingestions because of it. But you're correct. So opioids, mostly later teenagers, college students, marijuana, it's accidental ingestion among the younger. And man, that, that's crazy. So I, cause I guess for a kid, for a child to have this addiction or use disorder, they, I guess they have to be old enough that they know to ask for these medications. Like, like what age, what, what's the youngest age that you'll start to see the substance use disorder? Yeah, as I mentioned, late teens, 16, 17, 18 year olds, it's hard to elicit the information. So in, in pediatric, we do something called a heads assessment where you do your annual physical with a kid. You ask them all the history questions, their review of systems. And then I typically do my exam with parents in a room, but then I have parents or caregivers step out so I can ask kids confidential questions. HEADS stands for home, education, activities, drugs, 
sex, suicide, so on and so forth, safety, questions that might be difficult for them to answer in front of parents or caregivers. And that's when we might, some of that stuff might be revealed. But particularly when I was working in rural Maryland, the parents would reach out like, hey, my, my kid has a problem. We need help. His they father know. reached out to me because they, he knew his kid needed help. His kid asked him, hey, I need help with this. And it just, it, it broke my heart that we couldn't because of these artificial, there's, there's nothing magic that happens at day 365 when somebody turns from yeah, 17 yeah. to 18. The other side of that, though, is from a liability perspective, many of our interventions, medications, are rarely tested as rigor- rigorously among kids as they are adults, hence the reluctance to, to admit them. But I still i am trying to advocate and have our various advocacy organizations raise this point as well, participated in Maryland's opioid settlement fund distribution. So we make recommendations to the governor about where this money should go. And I was really adamant that we need to make sure kids are included, both in not just the abstinence efforts that go into schools to keep kids away from it, but also treatment because kids are dealing with this too. That's fascinating. So for these teenagers with substance use disorders, where are they getting the medications? Are these like leftover from surgeries? Are they buying like are they buying it in school? Where's it coming from? Yeah, it depends on your the demographics. When I was in rural Maryland, geez, it's it was it's so pervasive. Opioids. We're dealing with fentanyl and carfentanil at that time. Mm-hmm. It's you know, you'd be getting in, in, in a, into a parent's goodie box or what have you. Now, live and work in the D.C. metro area. Much more the SES socioeconomic status is much higher. So these are kids who have money who might be going to these parties where there's a cocktail of drugs that are available. But it oftentimes, to your point, it starts with leftover medication that wasn't properly disposed from uh, a medical procedure, be it a tooth extraction or a, a, a severe bone injury requiring opioids that folks just didn't get rid of stuff. Heck, I even looked at my own, own cabinet and there were some leftover opioids from when the wife was pregnant that I had to get rid of. So I took them to the police station. That's how it can start. And after there was a phase down in terms of the availability of the prescription opioids, you had the emergence of like heroin coming back on the market and the fitness and the synthetics, which are wow. much easier to produce, much cheaper. And it was harrowing to see how folks were getting access to it. Just, it was so so widely available, unfortunately. So much so that up the street in, 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 in Baltimore and in a number of jurisdictions, it's about harm reduction. It's like, People are going to do this, so let's get them test strips so that they know that whatever sample they have of heroin is not laced with fentanyl or carfentanil or something worse. I mean, that's where we are with this epidemic. Claim way too many lives. That's that's fascinating. One of the things I love about being able to be on this podcast is to ask all these dumb questions and, and learn stuff no, about things I haven't thought about in, in years. Man, I did not know all this. Crazy. I will say one interesting thing from the, so I mentioned briefly about how African-American kids were undertreated or were seen as addicts uh, because they were in such pain because of sickle cell. And historically, as there, there was thought to be this errant t- thinking among med, even current med students that black people can toler- tolerate pain higher than white people. And as a result, have historically been under medicated because of pain. And what we've seen, at least here locally in the D.C. metro area, is that or just nationwide, the percentage of people dying of opioids is oftentimes non, not, you don't see blacks as highly represented as, as a Caucasian or white folks in the, in that regard. So I, I don't know that, I wouldn't say it's a benefit of being mistreated <laughs> for so many years, but it just, it wasn't as, as pressing a problem in our communities as it was in the white community. Yeah. That's crazy. But I also remember back in when COVID was first coming on the scene where, where it was like only white people are dying from COVID. I remember that belief. I don't know if that was in, in your area too. We're like, yeah. oh yeah. I heard but, that. <laughs> and then, man, that, that turned around on us, huh? It sure did. It sure did. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, David, it's been great to connect, reflect on your practice in the Navy and the incredible things you're doing for this next generation, for our kids. As we start to close, I like to hear something that has recently inspired you, whether that's a book you read, um, a movie you watched, some music you heard. What's inspired you recently? Yeah, I think there, we're in, in turbulent times internationally and even locally. There's a couple wars going on that are highly publicized to the civil wars that are getting less press. A lot of suffering throughout the world. We're coming up to a, a major election now. Um, and I think the older I get, the more the more depressing the news sounds. 
So I, I, I just read, um, I'm reading a, a book, a collection of, of stories by Alice Walker, speeches and such addresses she's given called We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For. Trying to figure out how to find peace when the world seems to be on, on fire. It's marrying this notion of, we hear this adage, grant me a serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom, no difference. Operating from that standpoint, there's some things that are out of our control. And from a self-care pers- perspective, physicians in particular, we saw an uptick in suicides among us, uh, a lot of burnout during the pandemic. Self-care is huge. We go into the uh, caring profession, but we also all, oftentimes, sometimes we can internalize, take all that stuff home with us, but it's, it's figuring out a balance of how to self-preserve while continuing to fight the good fight. And yeah, this book, this collection of readings has given me some, some perspective on that. Yeah. What's the name of it again? We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For. All right. It came out a while ago, probably like 08 or something like that, 06. Uh, something that's been on my list for a long time, but I, I read way too much history, which is can be depressing too. <laughs> so I have to like spice <laughs> it, mix it up sometimes, something that's a little more uplifting. Awesome. That's that's incredible. I'm trying to think of what I've been inspired by. Not as you mentioned it, yeah, is the news is rough. I have been I don't know if it's inspiring or not, but when you s- begin to develop solidarity with different groups of people, people that have seen enough of something to where it, it encourages them to act and to move in in the right direction. That's encouraging that uh, we haven't lost our collective moral compass. There's still some people out there that right. are willing to say and do the right thing, no matter the the cost. And it gives me encouragement to do the same thing. Obviously, there's some discretion depending on your background, the culture in which you work or live, but it's encouraging. And, and it gives me strength to, to use my voice to speak out against things that that I think are wrong. So it's awesome, man. Yeah. And just know that the work that you're doing is inspiring to me personally. I was reading your story again. And I remember back to when I was at Camp Lejeune. So I was an 03, but you were 04. There was only one black <laughs> 04 that I knew of in the entire, in all of Camp Lejeune. That's thousands, oh, wow. like tens of wow. thousands of people. That's huge. That's huge. And when I got on the ship, I met my first, no, two 05s who were African American men. Huge. Just your presence is inspiring more than you may know. Oh, I, I appreciate that. Well, that, that is, it gives me the encouragement to get on here every week, obviously with the help of some incredible co-hosts, Dr. Nate Jones, Bianca Bush, she comes on quite frequently, and obviously amazing guests like yourself that make this uh, podcast possible. Thank you. Thank you all for what you all do. Please keep it up and take care of yourselves, man. Absolutely. Dr. Miles, thank you for coming on the Black Doctors podcast. We're here because representation matters. Always. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the podcast. If you haven't already, go to iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen, leave a review, leave a rating that helps the show grow. Every now and then we pop up on the top 200 charts uh, for for Apple. It's always special and lets me know that the show is getting out to the right people and that it's helping folks and always interested to hear what you want to hear on the show. We do kind of cater this to pre-meds or medical students or resident physicians. And and we'll be working on some content preparing folks for intern year. That's right around the corner. If you haven't had a chance, visit the website, www.theblackdaughterspodcast.com. You can even leave a voice note um, and, and contribute to the show. So we're excited to have that as a feature as well. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Black Daughters Podcast. We're here because representation matters. 